In this video, I'll be working through the second example of the more advanced value at risk problem. In this example, you see that you have an $800 million portfolio. He has a current VAR of 43.6, and you have a risk tolerance of 1%. Your boss wants to try to reduce the VAR by lower 23 million, but she does not want to harm the expected return. Um, you're considering an allocation to A, B, or C. You'll keep your current portfolio, but you allocate 20% to either A, B, or C. So you'll keep 80% in current, and you'll sell 20% in current, and buy 20% of either A, B, or C. So to do this, the first question your boss asks, or the, uh, the hedge fund committee has asked, is which of these strategies would you recommend, A, B, or C, and why? To do that, we need to get expected return, expected standard deviation, and then using expected standard deviation, we'll get the value at risk of the portfolio at a 1% risk tolerance. To get the expected return, we just I just set up a table that says expected returns, and then there's the current A, B, and C. The current is 6.2%, that's just given in the table. If we wanna get A, B, and C expected return, we know we have 80% at the current return of 6.2%, plus we'll get have 20%, in A, which is expected return 6%, so 80% times 6.2%, 20% times 6%, and notice I do everything in, in decimals, just to keep uh, avoid any uh, careless math errors. And when I do that, I get 6.16%. When I do this for B, B has an expected return of 6.2%, the same as the current, so obviously the expected return is 6.2. With C, six, C has a return, expected return of 6.3%, so it gives an expected return and combination of 6.2. Already we know we can, we can probably kick out A because this expected return is less than the current. But B and C are still good candidates, but we'll continue with the, the, the math. The expected risk, we know that the current portfolio has a risk of 5%, so that's given. The others, we will use this formula. Hopefully you remember this formula. It's the weight of A squared, and for, I mean in this case, the weight of the first asset is the current portfolio, so it's 80% squared times its standard deviation squared, plus the weight of the second asset, in this case it's asset A, or strategy A, which is an allocation of 20% squared times its standard deviation squared, plus two times the first weight, the second weight, standard deviation of the first, standard deviation of the second, and if you look back at the table, the correlation between A and B is 0.1. We do the same thing with B, the same thing with C, we substitute their standard deviations and we substitute their correlations. And when we do that, we get expected risk or expected standard deviations 5%, 4.21%, 3.89%, and 3.95%. We need to convert these into values at risk. We notice again that the risk tolerance is 1%. With the risk tolerance of 1%, we need to find that in the table, but of course the table does not show that side of the table, that type of side of the distribution. So we need to take one minus our risk tolerance, which is 0.99. We find 0.99 in the table. There it is, it's close enough, 0.9901. No need to interpolate. So when we look at that, that's 2.3 in the column and 0 0.03 in the rows. So a 1% risk tolerance represents a 2.33 standard deviation event. So the number of standard deviations is 2.33. We use that and plug it in to get our value at risk in percents and dollars and percents. It's our, remember, it's the mean minus the number of standard deviations times the standard deviation. Our mean for the current portfolio is 6.2%. Our number of standard deviations is 2.33 times our risk, which is 5%. And notice I write it as a positive number. We always just write VAR as a positive number, so 5.45% convert that into dollars, we take our value at risk in percents times our portfolio, 800 million, and we get a value at risk of 43.6 million. Do the same thing with, with adding with current strategy A, adding, I mean, adding current with strategy A, current with strategy B, and current with strategy C, and we get risk at 3.64, 2.87, and 2.98%, converting those into dollars, 29.12%, 22.94% and 23.84%. Now your boss has asked which of these allocations do you recommend and why? And remember your boss had the goal of not harming return. B and C would 
achieve that. A does not. The second goal of your boss was to reduce the value at risk below 23 million. A does not do that, so it's out on two strikes. C does not do that, its value at risk is above 23 million. Only B maintains the current return and gets your value at risk below 23 million, so I would recommend that strategy. We can graph it, and when we graph it, and that's the second question your boss asks, is graph the current and each option to demonstrate your rationale using VAR in percents as your measure of risk. And so I have expected return uh, on the y-axis, I have expected risk or value at risk in percents on the x-axis, and here's my current portfolio, which is expected return of 6.2%, and it's risk here between 5 and 6%. A reduces my expected return but the, and reduces my risk but does not get my risk down below the target VAR. The target VAR was $23 million. If you take $23 million divide by the portfolio, you get an ex, a targeted VAR of 2.88%. I put that in there just so you can see it. So you look at C, C looks pretty good. It takes the current return and increases it. Not much, just two basis points. So that probably gets lost in rounding, but just to be pure with the analysis, it increases our expected return However, it does not get our, and it does reduce risk, which is good, but it does not get the risk below the target value risk of 2.88%. Only B maintains return. It doesn't improve return, but does get the risk below 2.88%. So that's my rationale for, for selecting B. You need to put that into your answer. That B both maintains exi existing return, the current expected return, just like your boss requested, and gets the expected risk below the target bar of 2.88% or below the target bar of $23 million. The last thing your boss asked was related to a simulation. And I, I provided these simulations from, from best to worst case. So the worst simulations is here. If you have the current strategy, you would lose $60 million. If you added A at 20%, you would lose $41 million. If you added B at 20%, you'd lose $32 million. So that's the worst case. But remember your risk tolerance is 1%, so I'm not looking at the worst case. So of these 50,000 simulations, you want to your boss is not asking you to do a, a stochastic analysis of R, but she's simply asking is there any concern about um, your using the parametric VAR given the output from your stochastic VAR. So turn, determine if this model, the stochastic model raises any concerns about the use of parametric VAR and what may be the source of those concerns. Make sure you address both of those. What issues does it raise and what be, might be the source of that? And so when we look at this, what, the first thing we gotta figure out is which of these simulations represents a 1% risk tolerance. So we have 50,000 simulations, a 1% risk tolerance, so the 500th from the worst simulation will be our value at risk. So we have 50,000, we take 50,000, subtract 500, and remember you have to add that one because we include the very last one, 50,000. So we include the very last one, we have to add one. So that means our VAR is actually 49,501. Here's our VARs for each of the strategies, 44.5 million and so on. I put that in the table. Here's my paradigm VAR that we calculated earlier. Here's my stochastic VAR that we just got from the table. And one thing that you will notice from each one of these is that the parametric VAR is lower and, and in fact, with B and C, it's a particular concern because you notice with B and C, the parametric VAR is quite a bit lower than the uh, stochastic. And we're recommending B, remember we recommended B to get the VAR below 23 million bucks. However, that $23 million was for parametric, but with stochastic, it was actually 24 million. Why might we see, why would parametric always give us lower values at risk than stochastic? And the answer is stochastic tends to be more sophisticated models. They can model more th more things like re reversion to the mean. They can in include uh, non-normal distributions. And because of that, it probably gives you a more accurate measure of risk. Parametric VAR, since it assumes normal distributions, it assumes that the distribution is, is exactly symmetrical, it probably understates the risk on, uh, of any strategy that has skewing to the negative side. And B and C especially, but all of them have skewing to the negative side, which makes their parametric VAR look less risky than the, than the stochastic VAR. You need to find a way to put that into words if you get a question like this. Usually that's what I'm looking for in the end, is that how parametric VAR tends to assume symmetry, tends to understate risk for those risks that have some downside risk that's not captured 
in the standard deviation and the normal curve. Thanks.